talk today about how you might enact safety in your senior design process. I'm going to present a lens today that looks at process safety. So that is when what you are designing in your senior design is something that comes across more like a process than like an individual artifact. We're going to use a similar approach to those of you who are doing artifacts. We're going to use FMEA, but what we think about when we do it is just a little bit different. So I'd like you to consider this and see which one's more appropriate. So when we're talking about process safety, we have three driving questions all the time. They are, what are the hazards? What are the safeguards that prevent those hazards from having uh, horrible consequences? And then how do we know those safeguards are working? How do we know that all the time? And to be able to answer these questions, we got to think about two definitions. I want to make sure everyone knows. One, first off, is a hazard. What's a hazard? A hazard is a negative consequence. And so this could be something uh, as relatively minor as losing a bit of our product uh, because something has happened that has caused that bit of product to be unusable, uh, all the way up to something where the environment or health and human safety are, uh, <clears throat> are challenged, which is very not good, and all of us would agree those are things that are hazardous. When we talk about risk, in technical terms, risk is not just something bad happening, but risk is something bad happening multiplied by the likelihood that that something bad will happen. So risk embodies both likelihood and consequence. And we'll be thinking about that a bit as we go on. So here is an FMEA table, and I'm going to break it down and look at it by pieces uh, as we go to give you an idea how we're going to use this thing and how we're going to construct it. But as a, a quick overview, FMEA uh, is failure modes and effects analysis. We want to use this as a lens to look at different things that might befall our process and then assess how negative those things are, what's the magnitude of consequences, and how likelihood, uh, how likelihood, how likely those consequences uh, are to arise, and then use that as a guide to where we spend our attention. So let's break it down a little. First, over here, <laughs> over here, we have uh, running from top to bottom, likelihood. So at the very top, we think about things that are rare. And as you proceed downwards, we get to things that are events that are much more common. So for example, if you were talking about a, uh, a chemical plant, uh, depending on where you have that chemical plant situated, an event that is foreseeable but rare might be a major earthquake, for example. Uh, whereas an event that is foreseeable and common might be something like lightning storms. Okay. And then going uh, across, we look at what those consequences could be. So starting at the near end, we have minimal consequences. What's a minimal consequence? Well, that really depends on what kind of process you're talking about. But in general, a minimal consequence will be something with a small financial impact and zero health or safety impact. And at the far end, we have catastrophic, something so bad the final letter has come right off. Catastrophic is something that we never, ever want to happen. It is something uh, ethically we are bound to attempt to prevent because catastrophic almost always means there are consequences for the health and safety of the public. So if we look at things that are rare and of minimal consequence, I'll tend to color those in in green as a note to say, it's not that these are of no importance, but these are not where we spend our limited time, attention, and money first. These are things we can live with, probably. These are things we can deal with. Uh, these are things perhaps that we schedule uh, our worries for. If we have something, even with a minimal consequence, that is common, 
we probably want to pay attention to that. We probably want to uh, make sure we design a way that, uh, that uh, even that minimal level of consequence, potentially. So I'm gonna make that kind of red orange. The place where we are bound to spend a lot of attention, however, is right here where these arrows are pointing, right where I'm standing, where things are both catastrophic and common. In fact, uh, as engineers, we are ethically obliged not only to identify this region, but to design it, if at all possible, all the way out of our process. So once we have identified this, we need to get rid of it. We need to eliminate it. We need to do something to move it to be less common and or move it to be less consequential. That, that's our goal here. So for example, if we have a chemical plant that uh, will explode if it gets wet from rain, well, that's common and catastrophic. That can't be allowed to happen. So we can't build it like this in the first place. We must, at this design level, make changes so that that uh, doesn't, that consequence set doesn't come to be. And so doing an FMEA, especially during design, is important because this allows us to devote our attention to where our attention really matters. We want to get rid of uh, as much as possible everything in the red and move it to orange. We want to move the stuff that's in orange over into yellow and green. So how do we do this? We change how the process works. We change what safeguards are in place. Uh, we uh, possibly site our chemical plant in a completely different location. If, for example, uh, there is you know, danger of something uh, that we can't mitigate around. You know, the earthquakes are going to be, uh, are possible, and when possible, they'd be so bad there would be nothing uh, we could do about it through design. Well, then we better not build a chemical plant there. So let's look at an, an example of this that I want you to work through. Here is a real chemical plant where something bad really happened. In 2017, Hurricane Harvey hit Houston and the surrounding area, where, as you may know, there is a lot of uh, chemical plant activity. And this one particular plant in Crosby, Texas, was uh, uh, making peroxides. And peroxides are an inherently unstable chemical. They are very reactive. And you might say, well, then we shouldn't make them. Well, no. We make them because they are reactive. They are useful because they are reactive. So that's the entire point of, of making these things. And one of the ways that we can keep them from reacting is we keep them cold. And uh, that is something that if you know anything about Houston, Texas, you know that has to be uh, done in a powered fashion. Houston is seldom to be counted on to be cold um, or at least cold enough uh, to, to keep these chemicals from reacting. Uh, so what is it that happened at this particular plant? The, uh, it was making peroxides and had uh, peroxides that it had manufactured on site. The hurricane hit and there was a uh, loss of power in general. Uh, and the plant had on site generators to maintain refrigeration. However, the generators uh, were located at ground level and there was also flooding. And the flooding was at a high enough level that those generators uh, had to stop working. The people who worked at that plant uh, somewhat heroically spread out uh, the chemical uh, warehouse contents through many tractor trailers and separated them so there would not be a single big explosion. Um, and then they evacuated the plant and they evacuated the area. Due to the rise in temperature with the lack of refrigeration, several of those trailers exploded. And then unfortunately, the remainder of them were uh, blown up in controlled explosions because uh, it was too unsafe to get near and try and refrigerate them back down again uh, once that was possible. So here are some things I want you to think about in imagining an FMEA for this plant. One, 
I want you to think of, now uh, I used the wrong word there. It's not a risk level. I want you to think of a frequency level. How frequent is a hurricane in Houston? And I don't want you to just make this up off the top of your head. I want you to go use uh, some data to come up with this. Uh, I've included above me a screenshot from Wikipedia where they have a list of all of the hurricanes that have uh, impacted Texas since 1980. You might use that as something uh, that you look at. You could also look at uh, data from the National Weather Service um, or from a variety of other models, including models that incorporate climate change. So come up with a uh, frequency level for a hurricane and then modify that. How about a frequency level that removes electric power? Or what's the frequency level of something that has significant flooding, a foot or more of water? So give those things, assign those things some level of frequency. And then I want you to think about the consequence level. What is the consequence for losing refrigeration? Um, I hope I made that somewhat clear on the last slide, but I want you to, to think about that one. If refrigeration goes, what happens? What is the consequence of that? And then having noted these things down, I want you to turn to your teammates and have a little bit of a discussion. <coughs> what kind of color range do you expect this would be? And what are some things that one could do to modify either the level of consequence, which you hear some of the uh, employees at the company did, or modify the uh, frequency level? What are some strategies uh, that you could use? We'll talk about those in class. So now I want you to think about your own process. And keep in mind, if what you are making isn't a process, it's more of an artifact, you think about this sort of table a little bit differently. But it is still the case that failures of some type or other are going to have uh, a level of consequence and are also going to have a level of frequency. So this is an example table that I made up for using with a, uh, a feasibility study chemical plant such as we might make in KEG 400. So we have come up with a, a series of severities and we've come up with a, severe, uh, uh, a series of likelihood. This is the sort of thing that you should be looking at doing for your own process. As you're doing this, next step is to fill in that middle. So the pieces of your process have a likelihood of failure and there are consequences to those failures. So how can you scope that out? Well, on the likelihood side, you might be able to look up uh, failure rates for the equipment that you are using. There might be historical data available. Um, many industries collect these data, uh, but also they tend to be proprietary. So for example, the petroleum industry has a large database of uh, different types of failures, but you have to be a member of the industry association and pay a licensing fee to get access to that information. Something that a large company can do, but not a senior design team. So you might be making estimations at this point, and that might be where we're at. Um, in terms of consequence, again, you may be using your intuition, but there are quite a large number of government and industry standards and regulations that you can look to to give you an idea of uh, what some of the legal and financial consequences are, if not uh, the precise um, uh, environmental and human consequences. So for example, OSHA, uh, EPA, Homeland Security, and state regulations may all have very specific consequences for very specific releases. So for example, if you have a, a tank that is full of a chemical that you have stored and that chemical leaks and uh, gets into the groundwater, there uh, might be a fine that is levied that goes with what kind of chemical it is, how much was leaked, um, and how far it got from the uh, plant. And these are all things uh, that you can look up. Some other important sources for both consequence and uh, likelihood 
are uh, the Chemical Safety Board, which is uh, what I was just referring to in the example, um, and, the chem and the Center for Chemical Process Safety, and the safety uh, branch of uh, chemical engineering. All of these have done numerous case studies that they publish out uh, to improve safety overall. That is their goal, to uphold the ethical responsibility of engineers, to hold paramount the health, safety, and welfare of the public. And so uh, all of these support that by uh, making clear what, what happened when an incident happens so that we can learn from that and do better next time. Also, many professional societies host uh, standards and regulations that you can also look to. Uh, AICHE holds them for uh, chemical engineers, but if you uh, look at um, civil engineering and at uh, ASME for mechanical engineers, they have the boiler safety codes, for example. So look at your process. Create an appropriate table. Think about the consequence levels. Think about the frequency levels. And then assess the different things that you are doing within your process and the ways in which they uh, may fail. Brainstorm that all out. If you find something that is in that red zone where it is reasonably common and of catastrophic or other very bad consequence, document that you found that and design around it. Get rid of it. That is a terrific way for you to provide value to your senior design client. For things that are more in the green and the yellow, uh, you can mention them, document that you've thought of them, even come up with ways to uh, mitigate them, but they aren't where uh, you need to concentrate most of your attention at this point. Your attention really needs to go after those dark red areas. So complete the example, work that through, think about what are the hazards, what are the safeguards, how will people know they're working, and that will help make you a safe engineer. Um, and remember, as I said before, this is a view on process safety. It makes a lot of sense when you are thinking about working in or as part of a process, chemical or otherwise. Um, when you are looking at the failure modes analysis for an artifact, it's just the product that you are concentrated on. It makes a bit more sense to attack it with the lens uh, that Professor Kim has provided. Thanks a lot. See you in class.